Hi, and welcome to chapter 10, Capital Budgeting Techniques. So in this chapter, we have a few key learning goals to discuss. We're going to talk about the key elements of the capital budgeting process. Specifically, we're going to calculate, interpret, and evaluate a few different capital budgeting techniques. First one being the payback period. Then we're going to move into net present value and its related function, economic value added. Then we're going to talk about internal rate of return. And then we're going to compare and contrast the profiles of net present value compared to the internal rate of return techniques and discuss how these two different techniques, net present value and internal rate of return, can develop into a conflict in the ranking. And specifically talk about the strength of each of these approaches. So what is capital budgeting? <clears throat> well, basically, companies are going to budget their capital. Capital, as we know from previous chapters, is the money the company has. So the company generates a capital pool. And then they set out to discover different potential investments the company could make. So the capital, capital budgeting techniques is evaluating these different investments and seeing, uh, based on how much money we have and what we paid to put that pool together, the weighted average cost of capital from Chapter 9, how are these investment projects going to maximize the firm's wealth? So the capital budgeting process, this is a formalized process to evaluate investments against each other and against the capital structure and the weighted average cap cost of capital for the business. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about capital expenditure. So a capital expenditure is an outlay of money or capital that is expected to produce some sort of benefit over a time period longer than a year. Well, operating expenses are more short-term um, expenditure of funds that are going to be within a year. So the benefits to these expenditures all occur within a year. So the capital budget is, is focused on the expenditures that are going to be longer-term expenditures. So there's, there's a couple of different... <clears throat> Uh, steps in the capital budget processing. So in capital budgeting, there's five distinct steps that are going to help us to um, analyze and interpret what's the best process or budget to organize, implement. So we're going to be talking about proposal generation, review and analysis, decision making, implementation, and follow up. It's the five steps. So let's talk about step one. Proposal generation. So managers at all levels in the, in, in the company are going to make, <clears throat> hopefully make, uh, contribute to the company in, in the form of new investment projects that are going to be reviewed by financial personnel. Some of these investment projects may be uh, an acquisition of another company, an expansion of a current product line, a purchase of current equipment, um, investment in another com a company, things of this nature. So proposals uh, that are going to require a huge amount of capital are going to, you know, going to receive, of course, more scrutiny than less costly proposals. For example, if a proposal is set up for the purpose, the purchase of a new equipment that results in higher productivity, productivity and lower electrical costs that, you know, we'll say it's a $50,000 piece of equipment, that review isn't going to be as rigorous as, say, a $5 million investment in a 10-unit expansion of the core business. Okay, let's move to step two. Step two is review and analysis. So the financial managers have to perform a formalized and organized analysis to assess, of course, the merits of each investment proposal. So in order to prevent any type of... Um, uh, liabilities, ethical issues, they have to have, managers have to have a formalized structure on how they're going to review the potential of each investment. So if something does go wrong, they could show that, you know, they did the proper due diligence in reviewing the analysis and their decision at the time. Step three is decision making. So the capital expenditure decisions are going to be on the basis of dollar limit. So if you're looking at your capital pool, you got to decide, we may have at any one time, there could be 10 potential investments that could be made, but we still have to boil it down to what are the 
um, investments we're going to we can afford and we can move forward with and that would give us the best amount of profit generation. So generally a board of directors or a team of very senior executives will you know authorize expenditures you know beyond a certain amount. Uh, plant managers will probably have the authority to make decisions uh, to compete compete to keep the production line moving that would be relatively smaller expenditures. So it depends on how big the investment is. If you're just looking to replace or buy some new equipment or machinery at that sort of relatively lower cost, you don't need as much of a finalized, um, formalized or as much of a high level review of that type of decision. But the big decisions, we're gonna require a much more comprehensive review before the firm will spend the capital to make that investment. Now, once those decisions are decided upon, step four would be the implementation. So this is, um, if the project is approved, now they have to plan um, to make the expenditures and implement the product. So expenditures for a large project can occur in phases. So for example, <clears throat> maybe they're building a new headquarters and that could lay out in a series of months or years to complete the, comp um, construction of that new headquarters. But a formalized plan has to be put in place as far as what's the timeline, uh, what are the key goals to be achieved at certain points uh, so that they can keep track of the budget of the project and whether it's on time or over budget. So you can see how the implementation, uh, the larger the project, the more complex the project, the more difficult this implementation can become. But it's important to keep track so costs don't spiral out of control and expenditures. Um, a good example I can give you is film production. So if a movie studio is going to okay a film and they give it an initial budget of $50 million, they, in the implementation of that film, the studio is going to want constant updates as far as how long the shoot's going to be, where they're going to shoot, where the money's going to be spent down to the last light bulb. So that way they have a better handle or control of the risks. And then finally, the last step would be the follow-up. So the managers in charge of the project are going to have to monitor and compare the actual costs that it took to implement the project, complete the project, to the uh, projections they originally uh, put together when they established the investment. Now, during the follow-up, managers are going to be expected to take some sort of action. You know, they may want to expand the project, if that makes sense. They may want to shut the project down. They might want to, you know, rethink if the situation changes, maybe it's something in the external situation or in the economy or competitor changes where, you know, different outcomes are expected. The follow-up is meant to put the investment back on track, on course, or maybe at some point just scrap the investment altogether if that makes more sense or would save more money. So those would be the overview of the capital budgeting process. Now, Let's talk about some basic terminology. We independent versus mutual exclusive type of projects. So independent projects would be projects whose cash flows are not going to be uh, related to another project. So they're independent. So rejecting one independent project does not change the desirability of other projects. Now, mutually exclusive projects. These are projects that are going to compete with one another for the acceptance um, or the elimination from the capital pool. Uh, it's specifically to other projects that can serve a similar function. So, for example, an independent project um, might be a series of you know anywhere five to ten projects. All of them um, could be accepted if the capital pool was large enough and all the projects were going to be profitable for the company. But a mutually exclusive project, it could be maybe you have one piece of land and you have to decide whether to sell that piece of land, build a building on that piece of land, build a restaurant on that piece of land, um, or do nothing. So these are all, you can't do more than one. So you can't build a, an apartment building and, you know, a big franchise restaurant on the piece of property. So it's the mutually exclusive projects would just mean you're deciding whether, you know, basically you have to, a common example could be you need to um, connect two, P two islands together. So you're either going to build a bridge or a tunnel. 
So you're not going to do both. You're going to pick one or the other as mutually exclusive. Okay, unlimited funds versus capital rationing. Now, unlimited funds is a situation where a firm can accept any amount of independent projects that are going to produce an acceptable return. So very few companies have unlimited funding. Uh, maybe just some of the top companies you would consider close to unlimited funding. Most companies fall with under capital rationing, which means that the financial situation that the firm is in usually dictates that they have a fixed number of dollars available to fund their capital expenditures. So in this case, companies have to be a lot more choosy on what projects they take on. So they have a limited amount of capital pool. So they may have, you know, 20 possible investments to, to look at. And so they're going to want to pick the, the best assortment of those investments to produce the highest amount of return for the business. So capital rationing um, is a limitation on how fast the company can grow and also increases the analysis portion of reviewing the projects uh, because it can be very tricky to quantify, you can easily quantify the money it's going to cost to take the project on, but it's much harder to quantify and, and verify the, the potential cash flow these projects will generate over time. So it's, it's generally an estimate. Okay, other basic terminology, accept, reject ver, uh, versus a ranking approach. So an accept, reject is just, just basically looking, it's sort of like a yes, no. So we're going to take the capital expenditure proposal and we're going to say, does it meet the minimum um, criteria? So if our, if our cost of capital is 10%, then we would say that we're going to reject any project that re that's going to have a return of less than 10% and accept any project that has a return greater than 10% because those we'll make money on. In a ranking approach, this is where we rank from best to worst all of the proposals. So in this way, we could accept all the proposals up to the point where we run out of capital. So if we have ranked our proposals, then we can um, spend the money in each proposal until we get to the point in the ranking list where we run out of funding. So hopefully we're going to rank the more valuable portfolios, uh, proposals at the top versus less valuable proposals towards the bottom. Okay, so let's talk about capital budgeting techniques. So... We want to make sure that whatever the company, remember the capital budgets to ensure whatever investments the company takes on, the company has the best chance of increasing an overall profitability or value of the firm. So financial managers are going to need some sort of quantitative, quantitative tools to help them evaluate each of these individual projects and help them to rank the investments. So there's a number of techniques that we can use and we can talk about. So there's more than one technique. Um, of course, the best techniques are going to take into account um, more factors such as inflation, time value of money, risk and return, and project valuation methods that are going to fail to account for the time value of money um, is going to have a less accurate um, analysis and less useful uh, projections moving further out in the future. Now. Let's look at this technique, the Bennett Company's rel relevant cash flows. So this is a basic problem. Um, we're going to help illustrate the, uh, the techniques described in this chapter. So here's the problem. This company is a medium size fabricator that's thinking about two projects. So one with conventional cash flow patterns. So project A is going to be initial investment of 420,000 and project B is going to be initial investment of 450,000. So the project is going to have the project, the projected cash flow for the two projects will be in this next table here. So we see that project A, these are the cash flows for over the next five years and project B, here are the cash flows over the next five years. So this is an equal, an equal number of money or what we call an annuity of cash flows for each of the years. And this is a mixed cash flow. Now, if we put that in a timeline, year zero is typically where we have the cost of the project. So that's year zero, and that's usually a negative number expressing an outlay of cash. Then the cash flows for the following years are plotted on the timeline. This is denotes the year in which the cash flow is received. So we could use, we'll come back to that analysis later. So we could use 
the simplest of the methods would be the payback period. So the payback period, uh, the time it takes to generate um, enough return to pay the initial cost of the project. So if the payback period is less than the maximum acceptable payback period, you want to um, accept the project. If the payback period is greater than the maximum acceptable payback period, you want to reject the project. Think of it this way. This might be an easier way. Uh, let me just see the upcoming slide. Okay. So think of it this way. You have, you want to buy two different pizza stores, pizza restaurants, uh, two different parts of the, in two different areas. Okay. Both restaurants cost a hundred thousand dollars to purchase. So one restaurant will generate $10,000 a year of cash flow. The other restaurant will generate $20,000 a year of cash flow. So if it costs 100,000 and I divide the, the annual cash flow for the first restaurant of 10,000, it'll take me 10 years to pay back my initial investment. On the second restaurant, if I'm making $20,000 a year and I pay 100,000 for the restaurant, it'll only take me five years to pay back that restaurant. So clearly the restaurant will take only five years to pay myself back would be the better restaurant. But if we set a criteria where we only want to accept projects that will pay themselves back within three years, we have to reject both restaurants. So you can see that with how the simplicity of this is, is look at any project and just see how long does it take to pay back that project. So, and now this, a matter of fact, payback in India. So in 2017, a uh, survey of firms in India just found that two thirds of those firms always or almost always conducted payback analysis when the when they made major investment decisions similar to results found in the US small companies in India were more likely than large firms to use the payback approach uh, for all its flaws the payback approach is still widespread around the world so here's a sort of a little analysis or survey of, you know what companies are using and most companies especially smaller ones are still using this payback analysis why why would they use it well it's not as accurate as some of the other analysis that we're going to go over later in this chapter, but it's the simplicity is the beauty of this analysis where it's just a quick and easy look um, at factoring in uh, what projects may be more valuable based on how soon you pay yourself back because it's the, the payback time is, can be associated with risk. Something is going to take 10, 10 years to pay yourself back. There's no telling what shape the business will be in 10 years, a lot more risk. But if you're going to pay yourself back within three years, there's a lot less risk. Now let's talk about some of the pros and cons of this technique. Well, um, sometimes uh, large firms, even medium-sized firms, small firms, will use a payback approach to evaluate, of course, small projects. Um, as one element of that evaluation. So you can use multiple techniques. So the payback period could add some extra insight um, in, in using it with other techniques. Now, a pro for the payback period is the simplicity of it. It's just really dividing your initial investment by your cash flow or that would be to get the number of years to pay yourself back. In some cases, if the cash flow isn't an annuity, even, even amounts of cash flow, you would just deduct your cash flow every year until you get to an end point. So by measuring how quickly the firm recovers this initial investment, the payback period also gives some consideration to the timing of the cash flows because you would put the, you would deduct the cash flows in order. So those are all some you know, pros. Um, now, if you're trying to do something um, in a quick analysis, just looking at multiple projects, the probably the payback period is the easiest to interpret um, and understand because of course managers are going to want a faster payback uh, on, on all projects, but specifically riskier projects where the, the shape or the dimensions of the market or the economy could be vastly different in the future. So the major weakness of the payback period is going to be that um, it's not going to 
reflect all of the known variables we have, such as uh, time value and money. So it's a subjective type of analysis because you're trying to determine the, the amount of time for the payback that's appropriate. But does that always align with shareholders' goals or maximizing shareholders' wealth? Because some projects um, may be slow to pay yourself back, but have much bigger future potentials. So it doesn't really take into account the future cash flows. It just stops at the cash flow which you pay yourself back. But it doesn't really look at how these certain businesses may ramp up or scale up more in the future. So, for example, you could have two projects where the payback period is both five years for both projects. But if one project has a lower, lot lower risk in the business continuing to grow over the next 10 years, you, that should be something that should be looked in the evaluation as well. And the payback period really just doesn't consider that. Okay. So if we look at these two projects, we have um, gold and silver here. So they both have the same initial investment. But the cash flows, the payback period is three years for both. So within three years, you pay yourself back the full 50,000. But the payback project for, so they would say the payback period, just say that they're equal. But if you look at the timing of cash flows, it looks like project silver is better because you the first year you get forty thousand dollars back you don't have to wait to the third year so that's why the timing of the cash flow should be considered as well as far as risk of the project all right now here are two other projects x and y so project x you pay yourself back in two years with project y you pay yourself back in three years so which project is better we would say the payback period is say choose project X because you pay yourself back in two years. However, with project Y, the year four and five are much more significant cash flows than years four and five on project X. So for project Y, the total cash flows you're gonna get over five years, we're looking at uh, $17,000 of cash flows over five years. And here we're only looking at 11,200. So I would say that even though the payback period says project X is better, project Y is better because if you look at all the cash flows, it's going to return more over a longer period. And that's one of the illustrations of how the payback period, if you're just looking at years and you're not looking at the specific cash flows, can lead you down the wrong path. Now, another method here is the net present value method. So this is a more mathematical method. And it's a technique that's going to utilize the time value of money, specifically calculating the investment's value by calculating the present value of all of the cash inflows and outflows. And the way the formula works is you take the present value of the cash flows minus the initial investment. And if that number is positive, the project will return uh, a profitable result. Now, as with my other videos, I'm going to just show you an Excel file how to calculate these um, capital budgeting techniques mathematically through Excel formulas and functions. So don't get too upset if this formula looks hard. I'll show you a very easy way of completing it within Excel. But what's important to understand is that not every opportunity uh, is going to have a standard cash flow pattern or an equal series of cash flows. So sometimes firms are going to receive more money up front and have to pay out some cash in later years. So the timing of the projects could require several years of cash outflows before inflows begin. And then that's why it's important to use a time value of money in calculating the investment's uh, present value. Uh, so you get a more accurate because it's reflecting the cost of the capital within the discounting the cash flows by the cost of the capital. So you can realistically look at the return of the project in, in relationship to the actual costs of taking the, ca the, the cash flows that the project will incur. Now, the decision criteria is pretty simple. If the net present value is greater than zero, you accept the project. If the net present value is negative or less than zero, you reject the project. So later, uh, in the second video, I'm going to follow up with some Excel work. And here's just 
This is incorporated in the textbook as well. So we'll look at projects A and B, but we'll utilize the net present value function to calculate the returns. You can also look at the um, you can look at the timelines. So a timeline is a great way to calculate or understand how um, the capital budget technique works. So this would be looking at an annuity-based timeline of equal cash flows, where we just the net present value just finds the value of these five cash flows. So the net present value of that discounted at a rate of ten percent is five hundred thirty thousand. Uh, if we subtract the initial investment from that, we get our net present value. If you have a mixed stream of cash flows, we have to find the discount of each cash flow as it's laid out. So in cash flow year four, it's $100,000, discounted at 10% is 68,000. But the year before, year three, when that's discounted, it's only discounted down to 75,000 because it's not as far out in the future. As year five is the furthest out in the future, that $100,000 with discounted will only be worth 62,000 for net present value. Uh, and when you take all these net present values, you add them together and subtract them from the initial project, you get a net present value of 109,000. So of the two projects, project A has a higher net present value, so that would be the project you would choose if they're mutually exclusive. If they were independent, you would choose both of them because they're both generate a profit. So we do have this thing where we could look at the net present value and we could calculate a profitability index. So if we take um, a project and we ha that, that has initial cash outflows um, followed by cash inflows, we can use this profitability index. And, we, and simply what we do is we take the present value of the cash flows. So this would be the present value of the cash flow calculation. And we divide by the absolute value of the initial cash flow, which means the initial cash flow is, is usually negative. So we'd make that absolute value, so it would be a, it would be a, you know, a positive number, so we could calculate uh, an index value. So if we get a profitability index that's greater than one, then the present value of the cash flows, of the inflows of the cash, are gonna be greater than the absolute value of the initial cash outflows. So we could take all our net present, all our projects, or all capital budgeting projects, investments, where we could put them through this profitability index, and we could kind of rank them by the you know higher their profitability index, the more desirable um, the projects are. And you would only want to invest in projects that have that are greater than one, have a profitability index greater than one, because that would mean that their net present value is greater than zero. So net present value and the profitability index are methods that we could use to come to the same conclusion. It's just how it might be easier to look at and a profitability index to compare rather than just simply looking at numbers. So, okay, so let's look at this example here. So in this example, we can refer, we're gonna refer back to figure 10 to uh, that we looked at just a little while ago. That was the figure where, I'll go back to it. This is figure 10 to where we show the direction of the cash flows and, and the discounting of the cash flows in relationship to the initial investment. So back here, um, now, so if we take the, the sum of the cash flows for project A and divide by the absolute value of the initial investment, we get 1.26, where project B is 1.24. So we say that project A is better than project B. So if we go back to 10.2, uh, that makes sense too, because in total dollar terms, project A is larger than project B. So you're going to get the same results using the profitability index that you would just looking at the straight numbers. That's not the case where we use compare net present value approaches to internal rate of return approaches, which we're going to be learning next. But now if both projects are acceptable because they're both above a one, so if they were independent projects, you could you do both of them. However, if they're mutually exclusive, you would probably lean towards picking project A. Although both projects are pretty close in cash flows and profitability index. So you might also want to look at uh, the risks of the projects as far as their future potential. So there are other factors that you want to in put into this analysis, not just only the straight number calculations. Um, 
Okay. Now let's look at net present value and economic value added. So economic value added is something a consulting firm came up with, and it's very close to the net present value method, but slightly different. So what we learned previously with the net present value method or approach, we're going to calculate the value investment over its entire life. Where the economic value added approach, we're going to look at measuring an investment's performance on a yearly basis or a year by year basis. So what we want to do here is we want to look at, um, so both methods are going to begin the same way the net present value does. We're going to calculate the project's net cash flows, but economic value added is going to look at the year's worth of cash flows in relationship also to the cost of capital. Now, now, so we know how net present value works, right? We take our initial investment and we should, and we, and then we look at the cash flows. We add up our cash flows for the project, subtract our initial investment, and we get either uh, a positive or negative number. Positive number means go with the project. Now, economic value added is going to look at the, um, it's going to take is going to subtract those cash flows from a charge to try to, to, try to capture the return of a firm's uh, investors may demand for a project. So the EVA calculation asks whether a project generates a positive cash flow beyond what the investors demand. So the investors demand is could be thought of uh, as a required rate of return. So if the required rate of return is satisfied, what money is there money left over after that? And if so, they're creating value for the company. <clears throat> So the economic value added, the value added portion is looking at cash flows minus this investor um, charge or, or um, percentage of return. So what's above that? Anything above that would be the economic value added. Okay. Now, so the method is going to determine if a project's going to earn what we call a pure economic profit. So the economic profit is going to be any money that's returned uh, beyond the normal competitive rate of return in a line of business. So basically, what we're looking at is, you know, if we borrow another way of talking about it, we could say if an investor borrows a million dollars for their capital pool and they employ a million dollars in their capital pool, okay, and at a interest charge or required rate of return of ten percent, so it's a hundred thousand dollar charge on that capital a year. So you have a million dollars worth of capital and you have, the company has to pay $100,000 to service that capital, which is like the discount rate or the interest rate. So if, the, if that million dollars goes into a project and that project makes $250,000 a year in return and you should track the $100,000 a year in the uh, interest charge, that $150,000 that's left is what we call economic value added or the profit above the normal rate of return or the rate of um, the capital budget uh, cost of capital. So it's really just seeing does the investment pay back the interest that, that the capital is incurring for that investment and any money above that is going to be the economic value added. Okay. Moving into the next section, which is internal rate of return. So the internal rate of return is another method, but now here where the net present value focused on a dollar amount, then the internal rate of return is going to focus on a percentage. So we're looking for a discount rate that's going to force a net present value or, or is equal to zero net present value. So we find the rate that lowers net present value to zero, that would equal the rate of return on the project. So in the formula, in the same equation, we're kind of rearranging that formula to make the, the answer zero. So this means the, the net present value is zero. So this would be the rate. What um, rate is going to make the net present value zero? So now recognizing that projects have different inflows and outflows in different time periods, uh, including your zero in this calculation, we're going to define um, the internal rate of return as a percentage of return that the project will deliver above its costs. 
Now, the decision criteria is pretty easy. If the internal rate of return is greater than the cost of capital, accept the project. If it's less than the cost of capital, reject the project. So how do we calculate the internal rate of return? Well, you could do a financial calculator, except financial calculators are something that was designed mostly so students could take financial exams in a classroom. In the financial world today, most people are going to use spreadsheets to calculate internal rate of return, net present value, and most business calculations are done, going to be done within a spreadsheet. So that's how we're going to calculate it, our, our internal rate of return and net present value. Uh, later in a later video, I'll utilize Excel to show you how to make this calculation. And this is the basic spreadsheet that we're going to use to make the calculation. So we're going to, I'm going to use the same template here and show you how to set up these formulas um, to calculate the internal rate of return of different projects. And again, going back um, to this timeline that we used earlier, but using this now for internal rate of return, we get the same two projects, A and B, with the same initial investment as before, 420000 and 450000 So we're going to find the internal rate of return of these cash flows that's going to bring the net present value to zero. So basically, at what rate, and the rate is going to be 19, at 19.9%, .9%, that's going to result in discounting these cash flows down to 420000 or net present value is zero. So when we calculate net present value at zero, we get the internal rate of return. Now on project B, uh, the rate of return is actually higher, 21.7. So we're going to have to discount a little, a little higher to get that these cash flows equal 450000 So we have a zero net present value. So that's the basic timeline view of this. So let's look at the net present value profiles and we'll graph the depiction of the net present value calculations at different discount rates. Um, so let's look at these projects. So project A and project B, and we have four discount rates, zero, 10, 19.9. So we know from the previous slide, the 19.9. So these are the same two projects we're using here in this example. At 19.9% project A, um, the present value equals zero and then 21% project B equals zero. So project A would be negative at 21% or I guess project B here, we're just not showing those calculations there. So let's look at this in this, in this, in a graph. So here's the profile. So project A at a low discount rate, project A has a higher net present value. This would be the net present value in thousands of dollars. So net present value of Project A is higher until we get to this 10.7%. At this point, the um, net present value of Project uh, B becomes higher. So this is crossover point. So depending on <coughs> this discount rate of the uh, company, we could have a profile could switch the, the, the overall net present value, the number of the net present value between projects. So at higher rates, the net present value of project B becomes better. And this is just a reflection of the, the timing of the cash flows in relationship to the discount rate. Now let's talk about um, conflicting rankings. So we have these two very popular approaches, net present value and internal rate of return. The results from these two approaches can have a conflict in how you would rank. So if you had 10 projects and you rank the 10 projects in order for best to worst using net present value and internal rate of return, they wouldn't match up 100%. And one big reason for that is the reinvestment assumption. So this is the overall cause of the conflict between these two uh, capital budgeting methods. So the net present value calculation is going to assume that the firm can reinvest all the immediate cash flows at the cost of capital, while the internal rate of return is going to assume that the firm reinvests the immediate cash flow equal to the, the rate of the project. So if the, if the rate of return of the project is higher and you're reinvesting at that rate of the return of that project, 
it's going to have um, a different overall results of the two calculations. So the timing of the profile is of the cash cash inflows received in the project going to be critical to how these conflict rankings are going to develop. So let's think about this for a second. So net present value uh, is going to say that whatever cash this project generates, we're, we're saying that it's going to be reinvested at the company's cost of capital. Now, the internal rate of return is assuming that if you make money in the project, it can be reinvested and earn a similar return as the internal rate of return in the project. So that would kind of like be saying if you had a bond and the bond paid a dividend, uh, you could reinvest that dividend back into the bond at the same rate. So say there was a bond paying 5%, and you made $50 of dividends, you reinvested back in the bond, and those $5, five of dividends are going to pay, get earn 5% on that. So whatever the reinvestment that the project is able to reincorporate the cash flows to continually expand the project to get um, the rate of return at the project rate. So, but that's usually not the case. If you, if you build a restaurant and it takes a while before you have enough money to make an, another location, so you can't reinvest those um, cash flows in that first restaurant. It may be two years before you have enough cash flow to buy the second restaurant and get return on those cash flows. In the meantime, those cash flows could be sitting in a bank account making very little return. You know, so if there aren't equal investments to put the cash flows into making e uh, equal uh, returns as the project we're looking at, the net the internal rate of return percentage may be misleading, and that's going to result in the conflict between the two approaches. So um, here's here's two uh, companies where the reinvestment rate here is 10% and here is 15%. So here years one through three, here are the cash flows. Numbers of years, they are an in interest. So if it's in year one, you only have two years to earn your interest. Year two, one year and year three, no interest is earned. So on these same cash flows, we see that because it's reinvested at the higher rate, we're going to look at the um, future value at the end of the year is going to be higher at the, if the reinvestment rate is higher. So you can see at the, um, the difference, the difference is about 10,000 between the two reinvestment rates. So reinvestment rates matter. So the net present value is going to assume reinvesting at the 10% of the cost of capital while internal rate of return is going to look at the 15% of the project. So they, even though they're the same cash flow, the same project, they're going to have different absolute results based on which capital budgeting method you want to use. So now, so this is what helps you decide which one to use. If you feel that the reinvestment of your cash flows is more legitimately reflected at the cost of capital, go with net present value. However, if you feel that the internal rate of return that the projects you're investing in, um, the, the proceeds or cash flows from those projects can be reinvested at the same rate than using internal rate of return. So the dynamics of the project are going to denote which of the two uh, capital budgeting techniques you should use. So if we look at, in this particular case, uh, initial investment of 170000 and then a large cash flow, the two cash flows, the total of the two cash flows um, at a 10 percent rate look, using net present value is 16 or 13.5 percent of internal rate of return and at 15 percent there's a at 10 percent we're going to get a um, 24,000 or a 15 percent difference okay so let's talk more about this conflict ranking so this has to also do with the timing of the cash flows. So both of these internal rate of return and that present value are going to be calculated based on the timing of the cash flows. Now, if the cash, if the upfront investment required by each investment is serial is similar, then after that, the timing of the cash flows could be quite different. So that's going to be. Uh, if we look at the two projects B and A that we we're talking about earlier, we can see that um, this is this is going to be a difference between projects B and A. So let's go back to B and A. Okay, so project uh, 
let me just get the case. Here's project B and A. So project A, it's 140,000 evenly every year. Project B, you get a bigger chunk of the cash flows up front and then less as you move forward. So project B, I think is just more desirable because I'd rather get more of my money up front sooner than later. But back here. <clears throat> so that figure, the upfront investment required is similar and not exactly the same, but the timely cash flow is quite different because project B, project B is not going to be as sensitive to changes in the discount rate because more of the money is in, most of the money is coming in in year one. So it's not going to have as big of an effect um, in relationship to the changes the discount rate than project A would be. So project A is going to fluctuate a lot more with the discount rate because more of the money is coming into the back end where the discount rate is more magnified. Okay. So if we're looking at um, the method of project A and project B, it, the internal rate of return would say, except project B because it has a higher rate of return, but uh, net present value would say to accept um, project A. Because project A, and if we go back to this, so, <clears throat> so you can see how project B should be 21% is higher than 19%. That's why project B would be accepted with internal rate of return. And if we go to the net present value, we see that project A has a higher net present value than project B at 110 versus 109. So that's the, that's the conflict there. Um, so project A, um, if the required rate of return is less than 10.7%, project A, if it's greater than project B. So um, <clears throat> now let's think about the initial investment as part of the conflict ranking. So suppose someone offers you two investments. You could invest $2 today and receive $3 tomorrow, or you can invest $1,000 today and receive $1,100 tomorrow. So the, invert, the first investment provides an internal rate of return of 50% on uh, just one day. So that return would surely surpass any reasonable uh, hurdle rate. But we're only really making a dollar on this. So here, here we're getting a 50% return in the day, and then project two, we're only getting a 10% return. So if we're looking at the internal rate of return, we only get a percentage. So 50% versus 10% would say take the 50%. But after everything's said and done, you're only making a dollar. So the size of the project and the magnitude of the invest, initial investment should be considered too. So you could easily see that in the net present value, but since internal rate of return is just a percent, you don't really see the size of the project. You know, So I'd rather make 10% on a $5 billion project as a return rather than 50% on a $100 project. It's just not worth my time. Now, so on the other hand though, the second project of course is gonna get a 10% return. Um, so it's less of, like I said, it's less of a percentage, but you're gonna be making $100 tomorrow rather than a dollar. So it'd be way better off taking the 10% project based on its size and the total return you'll get in a day. So then, it begs the question, which of these two approaches is better? So on an academic or, uh, level, net present value always comes out ahead. So it's, it's looked at as a better approach to capital budgeting for several reasons. Most importantly, net present value is gonna measure the wealth, the overall wealth the project creates or destroys in total dollar terms. So you get a very definitive answer. So most academics would say, um, net present value is a much better and more accurate approach and even a little bit more conservative of approach to capital budgeting. <clears throat> you know, so for an, you know, an, an investment pro a period, the net present value calculation is going to give you a more accurate single answer. <clears throat> but sometimes the internal rate of return calculation has more than one solution. So you could have multiple internal rates of return resulting from a capital project that may have this non-conventional cash flow pattern. So the maximum number of internal rate returns of a project is gonna be equal to the number of uh, uh, sign changes in this cash flow. So that's another thing to sort of worry about. Now, in a practical view, um, think about a business, business managers and business leaders. Um, 
even though the evidence and the research suggests that present value is superior, financial managers by and large rather use the internal rate of return approach. Um, more often or just as often as a net present value approach. Now, the internal rate of return technique is something business people feel a little bit more comfortable with because they think in terms of rates of returns more than actual dollars. Now, one thing that solves the problem of the, the dollar amount of net present value is that if I'm a chief financial officer of a company and people are bringing me investment projects with internal rate of return ranking, I'm confident that my people will weed out certain investments that are just too small to really matter or look at. So they're not going to bother bringing anything to me unless it's greater than a million dollars. And at the same end of the spectrum, if they know a project is just beyond the scope of the company, a $5 billion project, they won't bring those either. So they'll naturally cull the group of projects in the capital budget to, to an acceptable level of investment by the company. So that once I know that I'm giving a set of projects that are going to be within a, a tolerance range of acceptability for the company. I don't really need to know total dollar terms anymore because they're going to be a lot more similar to each other. So then I could more confidently look at the internal rate of return of those projects. So research has shown that when you survey chief financial officers uh, what, and ask them what method do you prefer to use to evaluate your capital budgeting projects and you know a finding of this was that more companies use <clears throat> uh, one of the approaches, um, which would be the internal rate of return. So the internal rate of return is more popular than the net present value, although they are actually pretty close to each other. You could say that they're so close, it's sort of a tie, but um, internal rate of return usually edges out net present value in, in most studies that compare what CEOs use. Um, now, it's if you look at large firms versus small firms, you're going to have a different set of responses. So larger firms would most likely want to use internal rate of return, where smaller firms, they don't want to use net present value. They use more of the payback approach in smaller firms. So I think me personally, I would say that it would be better if I was recommending to a company how to look at the capital budgeting process and what's the best way of analyzing their process. I would say that, you know, um, the payback period should be recognized. And I would recommend to business leaders, list the results of all three, payback period, internal rate of return, and net present value. So that way, even though the ranking will not be 100% aligned, there will be conflict in the ranking, at least the managers could go with if they prefer internal rate of return, maybe there are three projects with pretty close internal rates of return, 14.1, uh, uh, 14 and 13.8%. So those are pretty close in return. It'd be nice to see what the payback period is or what the net present value is in making the final decision. So I think that you know internal rate of return is fine to go with as a business executive, but you should always keep in mind the value that net present value or the payback period could give you in other dimensions of analyzing a capital budget. So I personally feel that, and I always requested to have all three calculated because I felt that they all had some value to add and that I wouldn't suggest business leaders just choose one of the approaches. I think they should use all three of the approaches and they could favor whichever one they want to favor, but I think they all have a certain benefit to the capital budgeting process. Okay, so that is chapter 10, the capital budget. This is the end of the, the lecture. I hope you found it useful and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you.